Hi, I'm Liz A. Bear. I'm a co-host on the C Word podcast. And a few years ago, I made the EC podcast for emerging conservation professionals. And hi, my name is Kelsey. I am the creator, host, producer, all of the roles for The Private Project, an art conservation podcast, focusing on interviewing private conservators and learning more about their business. Today, we're talking about how to make a podcast because with experience ourselves, we're both very interested in seeing more conservators making podcasts and producing them. Also, I just think that conservators are kind of the perfect audience to do a podcast for. Um, mm. I mean, you're, you're missing out maybe on the visual component, but we spend so much of our time working that I think a lot of people are either listening to music, audiobooks, or a lot of podcasts as well. And we love stories. Like, it's so interesting to hear how people got into conservation and what they're working on and their journeys throughout the field. Having the chance to hop on a Zoom with someone who's across the country and just chat with them for, you know, an hour or more about their experience has been incredibly beneficial. Yeah, it's about that access, you know, and exposing yourself mm. to completely different styles of conservation as well as mm. that ways of doing business, which is something that you talk about in your podcast quite a lot. Uh, which I appreciate because I don't feel that that's necessarily something that is at the forefront of everyone's mind when they're at a conference to talk about your taxes and uh, life insurance, all, all of those things you cover. They're so important. You're right. And there aren't a lot of opportunities to ask people that. And sometimes oh. it can feel quite uncomfortable to ask a stranger who, you know, you've just recently met, oh, like, did you have health insurance after you graduated? Right? Like, there's not really a good moment for that sometimes. Um, and I will say too, people's businesses and they're just are just as unique as their journeys into conservation. Like, it's been really incredible to see how people have transformed their conservation work to fit their lifestyle, their mm -hmm. lifestyle and their personality. And it's just as unique as the conservator themselves. So that's been incredible to get to know as well. Yeah. On the other end, uh, for me, working with ECPs, so people that haven't gone into the business side of things, haven't even like really perfected um, their approach to conservation. You know, I, we're both ECPs as well. It's been really comforting in many ways to talk about some of those struggles with people that can relate to them. I find sometimes that when I'm talking with mentors about some of the issues that I face, there's a bit, they, they have more distance from it. So it can be more mm. difficult to engage, but talking with the people that it's affecting in the same way that it's affecting me can lead to more solutions. I think that we benefit a lot from conversation and sort of just bouncing ideas off each other and having a podcast. And then following that, having a social media presence allows for mm. more people to connect on those online platforms as well. The social media aspect of podcasting for me was one of the most difficult elements of um, mm. producing a podcast, especially when you're doing everything alone. Uh, it's a job that's really meant for like at least two or three people, but you just got to do it yourself. I started with kind of echoing what I was doing on the podcast. So I would have little bios about the people that were on every episode. I would share questions, stories, get them to share the stuff so that their followers will find me. It's just a mm -hmm. lot of promoting yourself and being as innovative as possible to try to get people to engage because that's actually quite difficult, I've found. How about you? Yeah, I agree. I think that like promoting yourself and branding not only yourself but also the work that you do is not something that we talk about a lot in conservation and so that is something I also struggled with because I didn't feel like I could find resources on how to promote the podcast and there weren't a lot of other examples of people who were kind of promoting this kind of work within the conservation field um, and so I found that one thing that really was successful for promoting episodes is to post little like tidbits or like sneak peeks, little video clips um, to kind of give a sense of what the interview was going to be like before people committed to the full, you know, hour episode. Um, and that was really helpful. And I think that's kind of been my approach for social media.
I think that because podcasting is so multifaceted in terms of all the different Mm. jobs that you have to do, if you are somebody who is interested in making a podcast, there are going to be elements of it that come really easily. Like for example, for me, it's editing. I love editing a podcast. It takes ages, but it's it's very rewarding for me. And then there are going to be other things that you like aren't really your jam so much definitely Mm. reach out to people in your network not only conservators either just creatives in general and see if they can help you in any way either with brainstorming or in the actual production process for if you struggle with the visual effects i love canva it's a free like design program that helps you create content for instagram facebook whatever you have Um, And also I found going on Pinterest and looking at like podcast logos and the way that they design kind of their cover albums. um, That was really useful, even though it wasn't like specifically about conservation. I found that the ways that they kind of visually presented their podcast um, was really interesting. So now that we talked about social media, maybe we can talk through the editing process because Mm. you said it's something that you enjoy. I actually find it to be one of my least favorite parts about running the podcast. So I'm (laughs) curious if I can get some tips from you. My approach for editing is to use multiple different um, wave forms. So I have a separate audio file for each person that is in the interview. And then that allows me to get rid of all the ums and uhs that I don't really like or any crosstalk, you know, if two people end up talking at once, you can change it so that instead of talking at the same time, you pace it out a little bit so that you still get both people's information in there. And then in terms Mm -hmm. of workflow, I tend, because I'm on the episode that I'm editing, which I think would be most people that are watching this video, I will go through and sort of block out the different sections first so that it makes it more manageable instead of trying to like edit just straight beginning to end. And also this way, if I'm in the middle of a section and I've been working on it for like an hour and I'm just so, so bored, I can jump to another section without anything getting um, mixed up during the editing process. That makes so much more sense. I oh, have you. been the person to start editing from start to finish. <laughs> so I'm going to steal that. <laughs> I also like know when to take a break when I can recognize like the pattern for a uh, for myself mm-hmm. and the other person. That's when I know it's time to like yeah. take a step back and go outside. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I also have found that I don't know what program you use, but I love Audacity, which is also a free program. I found that their, um, what would you say, maybe interface for someone who, I mean, I've had previously no editing experience, but I found theirs to be very easy to understand. There's great YouTube tutorials if you get lost. Um, And I'm totally going to steal that section idea. That was so smart. (laughs) Well, I'm going to steal Audacity from you. Okay. (laughs) Also, now that we're talking about equipment, what about like, do you have any microphones or recording equipment that you use? I don't know. I don't have a microphone. I just use what is coming out of my computer. I can see that you have a microphone. So perhaps our viewers, if you can tell any difference between our audio, that is why. Um, Yes. Let me know if this $50 was worth it. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. You can get really cheap equipment. I haven't gotten around to it. Most of what I do is I usually don't record in a space like this that's really open and has glass that everything can Mm -hmm. echo off of. I record in my bedroom where the sound gets a little bit more muffled up by the carpet and the bed sheets. But when you have somebody as well that's on on the other side that doesn't have any recording setup, that's the advice that I give them as well to record in their bedroom, to put some pillows around. I'm just like pitching audacity right now, but I know they have um, a program that if you don't have a good microphone, if you can't find a space that has good audio and there's like some white noise in the background, I know they have a program to cancel out, like identify that background noise throughout the entire recording and cancel that out. So there are definitely ways to get around it if you don't have the money for a microphone or if you don't have a good quiet space to record. 
I mean, practically the preparation that I do for an episode is that I get my co-hosts lined up. Uh, when I was doing the EC podcast, that was a panel of people. And what was really nice about that was that it was all students that knew each other. So they already had a bit of a rapport amongst themselves, which was really nice. Uh, it's kind of hard when you have a panel of people speaking together to get the interview to a place where they feel comfortable. And then we would record and I gave them the opportunity to listen to the episode before it was published as well. I have a very similar experience. So in talking to someone one-on-one -on -one, in my first cold email where I asked them for an interview, I attach a general question list, which I've kind of customized to fit them. Um, and I try to think about what could this person add to this conversation? What unique experiences do they have that they want to talk about? While also giving some flexibility of, you know, if there's something here that you don't feel is represented, if there's a topic that we aren't going to discuss, feel free to add it. Or if there's something that you maybe aren't interested in talking about or have nothing to say, then we'll just skip past it. Mm -hmm. So kind of building a customized question list for the interviewee before we even meet. Mm -hmm. I think when I first started, I was so focused on getting like the actual interview and recording right. Yeah. Um, I didn't anticipate how much time it took to do editing and social media and promoting. So I think that generally for me, the interview, final interview time, um, if it's like an hour, then it means I've probably spent about maybe five hours with um, mm -hmm. editing and social media work. Um, and so I think for anyone interested in starting a podcast, I think the greatest resource that you use for developing your podcast is your time. It does take a little bit more time than even I anticipated. Um, and if you can get funding to support your project, so it's pay time, that's great. But for me, I don't unfortunately have funding. So it is a lot of volunteer time that's unpaid for me, which I'm happy to do, but that might not be sustainable for everyone. Yeah, I did it for free as well. And I'm sure that you can agree it's not actually free you're spending money in order to be producing a podcast yes um you know I just started working on this season of the c word and I've noticed a complete difference working with a group of five instead of a solo group of one it mm -hmm. is a lot easier in so many ways because everyone's able to play to their strengths and you can divide the work amongst you so if you are interested in starting a podcast and you're unsure if all of the different elements of podcast producing are for you, consider having a co-host and doing it with somebody that you feel comfortable with because having that camaraderie immediately with, before you even have any guests is also going to be helpful in get, gaining an audience, I think. I completely agree. And also I want to say like, you don't have to be the perfect editor. You don't have no. to be the perfect interviewer. Like you will get a crash course in these skills if you don't feel confident in them and you will get better. Do some research, see what you like and what you don't. And you don't have to be perfect at everything. You just have to start. Really good advice. I would be very, very happy to hear more podcasts from anyone in conservation at any stage of conservation as well. Yeah, the field is so multifaceted and there's so many interesting stories within conservation that, yeah. you know, the three podcasts that we've talked about cannot cover everything. There's so many stories left to be shared. So if you feel like you have something that you want to share with the community, definitely go for it. There's yeah. space for you. And please feel free to reach out to either of us on social media. You can find me at EC Podcast on Instagram. You can also find my private Instagram, which is at Liz Hebert, XCVI. You can find me on Instagram at the Private Project Art Con, or you can always email me at the Private Project Art Con at gmail.com. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for your time. I hope you found this useful.